Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Now, my co-host for today is my dear friend Hazel Diana, and our topic is social construction and social critique. We have different ways of categorizing things. We categorize non-living things in terms of their type, or in terms of their shape, size, and color, and so on. On the other hand, we ca categorize living things in terms of their biological families. We have general categories for microbes, plants, insects, and animals, and we have specific species under these categories as well. Now, some philosophers think that these categories are natural and objective features of reality. But what of us? How should we categorize us ourselves? Now, of course, we belong to the biological category of Homo sapiens. But we also have a gender. We belong to a certain class and race. Now, some philosophers have labeled these as socially constructed categories. But what kind of thing is a social category? And why does thinking about these things matter? Now, to guide us through this conundrum, we have Sally S. Langer, Ford Professor of Philosophy and Women's Studies, Women's and Gender Studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So, hello, Professor. As Langer, welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for Hello, inviting professor. me. <laughs> okay, so you have work on many areas of philosophy, from abstract topics like the metaphysics of persistence to more concrete ones like the philosophy of adoption, race, and gender. But how did you get into philosophy in the first place? So when I was a, a a high school student, I took a history class in which we read Plato. And I thought that reading Plato was history. And I didn't realize it was philosophy, though I loved it. It was my favorite thing in all of high school. And then I go to college, university, and I, and I didn't um, know that I would be, uh, I would enjoy philosophy classes um, because I tried history because I thought that's where you got to read things like Plato. Mm. Um, and what happened was I uh, started becoming interested in religious studies and uh, I, of a form that was very much drawing on um, uh, continental philosophy and some uh, important uh, continental philosophers thinking about um, language and, and how language shapes our understanding of the world, etc. And I was interested in the question, what is the relationship between religious experience and aesthetic experience? Mm. And so I went off to India for a while and I studied um, Bharatanatyam, which is a, a dance in Southern India that had been a temple ritual, but became a secular art form. And I was interested in trying to bring that back to um, my writing a thesis, a master's of undergraduate thesis. Um, and when I came back, the professor I'd been working with and who encouraged this had not gotten tenure. Mm -hmm. And the person who replaced him was not enthusiastic. And so someone said, well, you know, you've done all your, your religious studies requirements. Maybe you should go take some philosophy and you can have a joint major in philosophy and religion. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? Philosophy? And I went <laughs> over to philosophy and I took a, a course from George Beeler in metaphysics and I found my home. It was just like, yes, this is where I belong. This is where I should have been all along. And so then George and um, David Reeve, who was also there at the time, he does ancient philosophy, they encouraged me to go to graduate school. And uh, so I did. Okay, so th that's interesting because you started out as a uh in religious studies. So what mm -hmm. got it, you into religious studies in the first place? Well, I'm not sure. I think part of it was I had, like oftentimes in college, you have a friend who's taken a class and thought it was a great class and then recommends <laughs> it and then you take it or something like that. Um, I think that it, I was a very you know, abstract thinker. Mm -hmm. um, I was very interested in experience and the meaning of things. But another way of thinking about it was that I grew up um, a Christian scientist, which is a very um, marginal religion mm -hmm. um, that, that has a quite um, 
uh, unusual metaphysics. And their metaphysics is that um, there's no material world. Um, so they're kind of Berkeley and idealists. There's a way in which they're Berkeley and idealists. Mm -hmm. And I uh, fell from that tree um, pretty early on in my teenage years and was not a believer. But it, I was always fascinated by some of the kind of deeper metaphysical questions that the, the, I'd been taught as a child in my uh, religious upbringing. And so maybe there was another part of me that was interested in tr finding a place where I could think through those things a bit more. What is the relationship between you know, um, the, the material world and the spiritual world? Mm -hmm. um, is there such a thing as the spiritual world and things like that? Um, do you think uh, this is what makes you different from other philosophers? <laughs> you know, sometimes, so when I was in graduate school, when I was an undergraduate and then in graduate school, there was a push, you know, Quine and all of that to think that abstract objects were very suspect. And um, we shouldn't believe in abstract objects. We should just believe in material particulars. And I had always thought material particulars are pretty weird. I don't really understand them. What is matter anyway? <laughs> and I think that, so I wrote my, my dissertation in graduate school on the problem of persistence through change. So what, how is it that a material particular can persist through change? You know, doesn't it, every time it undergoes any sort of alteration, it goes out of existence. What is the essence? You know, what is matter form? You know, all of these sorts of things. These were very mysterious to me. And um, I wrote my, my uh, PhD on those topics. And I think, yeah, there was a way in which I was cutting against the grain because I did find the abstract world, also the aesthetic world, the spiritual world, those are things that have always been very meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. uh, art and aesthetics and, and spirituality. And going into philosophy, it was like, no, it's all physical <laughs> particulars, one <laughs> physical particular after another. And I'm going, what? What are those things, physical particulars? Anyway, I don't even know what matter is. And so it might have been, might have been something like that. Okay, so aside from George Beeler, who else influenced your overall philosophical ideas? Well, David Reeve did. He um, was he was someone who worked on Aristotle, among other things. And um, I am very interested in Aristotle, have been for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, George Myro is someone who uh, died in 87, I think. Um, he was very sad. He died of AIDS. He was young. He was in his early 50s. He was my dissertation supervisor. Um, he was a brilliant man, and he was someone who was very interested in kind of transcendental arguments and things mm. like that. Mm. And so um, George, but also very analytic. And so George, uh, Paul Grice, Alan Code, those were all people who influenced me in my coming up in uh, graduate school. But since then, I've been influenced by um, Ian Hacking, uh, Marilyn Fry. Uh, Nancy Bauer, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, Marx. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of my, my, my influence, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, there's just a whole world out there of people who, uh, Elizabeth Anderson has influenced me a lot. So um, I think I'm, I'm kind of a mishmash of methods and styles. Yeah, so in what way has philo your philosophy training influenced your overall way of thinking? about anything? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, so I, um, as, as was probably clear, I grew up in a, um, in a family that was not very philosophical. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was very conservative and waspy. My, my parents were Republicans. Um, my father was a traditional patriarch of our family. Uh, and I had some experiences, and so I was so I was born in fifty five so I was not exactly part of the civil rights movement and the women 's movement of the sixties because i wasn 't really old enough, but I was influenced by those sorts of things and became very interested in social justice issues, mm -hmm. but I had no tools for understanding social justice um, and I then started doing metaphysics, which had kind of come up through my religious background. Um, 
But there came a point when my activism felt like it, were, it needed a kind of intellectual enrichment. And my philosophy was a bit too sterile. And so that combination of bringing philosophy to my activism uh, has really had a huge impact on my life. So I, I feel as though my, um, my philosophical work is very influenced by my political work, but my political work is also influenced by by philosophy, because as I was reading more philosophers and reading more feminist theorists and critical race theorists and such, my understanding of the world um, really profoundly changed. Um, and I began to see um, social systems and how social systems work and how systemic justice works. And, um, and that was important to me. Uh, this is sort of a personal question, um, but when, we, when you were studying, you said that you were in um, graduate school, was there a significant event um, in society or uh, during that time that really influenced you to go into activism? Or maybe there was a significant event in your life that triggered this? Yeah. So um, I, I've written about this and also, I mean, it's a public f fact about me, so I don't hesitate to share it with you, even though it's very personal. But when I was a, um, a senior in, uh, as an undergraduate, uh, I was asleep in bed and, and someone broke into my apartment and, with a knife and I was raped. And uh, that changed my life. I mean, I, I was enraged and I just couldn't believe um, that, you know, that for no reason, for no reason at all, this terrible violence um, and very traumatic experience had, had happened to me. And so I became quite uh, committed to uh, feminist work that was opposing rape culture and violence against women and domestic violence issues. Um, and those mattered uh, in a way that I couldn't put it down. It was just pressing on me in a deeply personal way. And then as time went on, I became more interested in race and more interested in class and then more interested in disability. So, but it, it really started with that experience of, of rage um, uh, in, in the face of this violent act. Okay, so let's go to your social construction idea. So one of your big ideas in philosophy is the social construction of race and gender. What does social construction imply, and why does it mean? What does it mean for something to be socially constructed? It's a really good question and a pretty hard one. <laughs> uh, so, so the idea of social construction often emerges in the context of a kind of debunking project. So, on one end, you can say, well, social construction just means caused by social causes or social factors, or there's a social factor involved in the production of it, et cetera. And that's the kind of loosest possible understanding. But very often when you say that something is socially constructed, what you're trying to do is criticize or debunk a kind of naturalistic understanding of it. So when you say gender is socially constructed, what you're saying is gender is, is not determined entirely by sex or by physical features. When you say race is socially constructed, you're saying race is not a biological category. It's a social category. And so one of the reasons to do that is that much of the ideology of racism and sexism uh, presupposes that women are by nature submissive, nurturing, inferior, whatever, um, that people of color, um, say black people are you know, violent or or uh, lazy or you know less intelligent, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, like that. Um, and so, this idea that this is all happening by nature uh, seems to justify the treatment of women and the treatment of people of color in a way that is unjust. And so, the social constructionist comes in and says, "No, you're wrong. These categories are categories that you've created." And the, the features of those categories, the general characteristics that you attribute to those categories have been produced by the very systems um, that have created the categories to start with. 
So it's a, it's a kind of debunking effort to dislodge certain background assumptions that fuel injustice or, or uh, undergird injustice. Okay, so let me try to understand this. So your social construction idea is something like, here's a reductionist account of what it is for, to, what it is for someone to be gender. And you're saying that that's not the only thing that's going on. Right. It's not, it's right. not, so you're not just reducing gender in terms of sex or in terms of biology. So there are right. some social structures going on. In that. Right. Yeah. And people will talk about it in different ways. So some people, when, when they think about gender, for example, they're just thinking about um, gender identity. Some mm -hmm. people, when they think about race, they just think about racial identity. And, and that already is saying, look, gender isn't just a matter of your body, it's how you identify. Race mm -hmm. isn't just a matter of your body and your you know, phenotype and your skin color and hair texture, it's about how you identify. And so that already is a kind of debunking. But my view, I have a particular approach to social construction where I'm interested in seeing these social categories as position within a broad social structure. So my version of social construction isn't the only version of social construction. There are all kinds of ones. I mean, another thing to point out is that um, there's a, a difference that Ian Hacking talks about that I think is important too, about the social construction of a concept and the con social construction of a real material uh, sort of category of people. Mm -hmm. And so you say, well, a concept is socially constructed just means that, well, there's a particular history that enable it, that a concept to evolve as something that we talk about, a way that we use it, et cetera. And we could have had a different concept. That's a, a notion of social construction that is used in the literature, especially less so in philosophy, but in other fields. But there's another notion of social construction where what we're talking about is how, how sort of a racial group, um, what makes, what's, what does a racial, what do the members of a racial group have in common? Mm -hmm. What makes them a racial group? What is it in, in virtue of which they are raced um, as white or et cetera. And we're talking about the concrete reality, not a concept. Mm -hmm. and, and how do we understand these groups in the world? Um, and, and what are the causes and the sources of those groups in the world? And that's what I'm interested in. And that's where I'm interested in talking about, you know, laws and social systems and norms, et cetera, et cetera, that, that are um, playing a role in producing identities, such as a racial identity or a class identity. Okay, so you, you mentioned about Ian Hacking's idea of social construction, but how does your view differ from other social constructionists or constructivists like Bruno Latour, uh, Berger and Lachman, and Paul mm -hmm. Bukhushan and John Searle? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that there are some people who are inclined to think that um, they focus on the, the concept and they think, oh, this concept is socially constructed and we use it to understand the world, but mm -hmm. there's nothing really corresponding to it. So when sometimes when people say race is socially constructed, what they mean is race isn't real. It's mm -hmm. an illusion. We go around in the world thinking there are races because, but that concept has come down to us through these problematic processes and there really are no such thing as races. So which, so, you know, which is like this, the concept of which is socially constructed and witches are socially <laughs> constructed. And the idea is, look, somewhere this idea came from, but there's nothing corresponding to it, right? It's, it's, and that's going to be on one approach to thinking about this. So race is like which, mm. um, whereas others like John Searle are inclined to think more of institutions. Mm -hmm. So they are interested when they're thinking about social ontology is sort of what makes something money or what makes something the Supreme Court or what makes something, and they have in mind this, this action, what he calls the assignment of a status function, mm -hmm. where we decide 
that pieces of paper that look a certain way and little pieces of metal that look a certain way are going to be um, the holders of value and the medium of exchange, right? And so, so they end up being money um, or that a certain group of people get to be the Supreme Court because we have designated them as the Supreme Court. And so they have this idea that, well, institutions and such are created by, by us, by our collective intentions. And my view differs from both of these. Um, so I think that, that societies are best understood as a collection of systems, systems that organize things of value and we need to coordinate in order to distribute, produce, you know, um, uh, get rid of uh, things of value and things of disvalue and to exchange them. Mm -hmm. And so there are these systems of coordination that, um, that are responding to a, uh, uh, an agreement about what is valuable or what is not. And the way those systems work is they, they have a division of labor, for example, they organize us about who does the cooking and who does, and, and who does the, the, the leadership and who does the ruling and who does this and that and the other thing. And these are all systems that are ways of organizing people. And so the way I think of social construction is that sometimes in these systems, there are groups of people that function in particular nodes in the system. And those are going to be naturalized sometimes because we want to think that their place in the system is sort of given and can't be changed. So I think women are, are situated in a system of reproduction, sexuality, and childcare, and those sorts of things. And then we say, and this is a, a system that has been created by us as part of a distribution of labor. And then we say, well, yeah, but women love to do those things, or it's natural for them to do those <laughs> things, or that's determined by their biology that they do those things. So masking the fact that it's just a product of the fact that we have organized ourselves mm. in this particular way. And so on my view, they're very real, right? It's very hard to get out of that node in the system because you're gonna be pushed into it and there's gonna be similarities between you and other people in that node. Um, but what we do when we say it's socially constructed, we debunk the idea that it's natural or inevitable or immutable. So, um... Can you explain this further, like, for example, in the mm -hmm. case of um, gender, race, and class? So um, can you give more examples about uh, these kinds of systems? Yes, definitely. So one of the best ways to sort of think about it is historically, um, for race and class in particular, um, and how economic systems needed certain groups of people to do certain kinds of labor. And um, one story about um, slavery in the United States is that um, at a certain point in time, there were, there were people with different origins from Europe, from Africa, from many different places, from Latin America who had Come, and they were, they were um, some of them indentured servants and some of them, they were working for low wages, et cetera. And some of them were slaves. And they, um, and they were being exploited by the, the landowners, the plantation owners and such like that. Um, and there came a moment where it was very important to prevent this group of people from gaining solidarity and protesting the kind of uh, treatment that they were getting in the hands of the landowners. And so the landowners figured, and this is a, I'm not gonna try to defend this in great detail, but it's a kind of case study, a sort of example that uh, others have developed, Barbara Fields in particular, mm -hmm. um, where they decided, look, we want these, these white folks, not to the poor whites, not to rise up against us, the rich whites. 
So we're going to divide and conquer. We're going to make it clear that we are of the same group as the poor whites, meaning the, the wealthy whites, mm -hmm. and get them to hate the blacks, right? And to not want to have anything to do with them, not identify with them, not form solidarity groups with them, et cetera, et cetera, in order to maintain this power and control. Now, one of the things that's very notice that's very interesting about this case is that you can see someone's skin color from a distance. You can you don't have to know them. And so it was also a way to create laws that said if you're black. You should be, you're enslaved, you're a slave, so that they could identify from a distance who should be captured and taken back to the, their owner, so to speak, their, so to speak, owner. And so they had a system of maintaining power and control over the poor whites and the blacks by dividing them mm -hmm. and by maintaining a system of slavery that could be, could be um, legalized and enforced um, because of skin color as a basis for this, for this you know, horrible institution. And so what you see then is that, whoa, this, this division between white and black in the United States was not a division about who worked hard or who was intelligent mm -hmm. or who did anything like that. That wasn't the story that created this division between whites and blacks. It was, it was a product of a kind of capital, capitalist sort of maneuver mm -hmm. to divide and conquer. And then this became absolutely important, right? Because white people didn't want to be allied with black people. If you were, then that was going to be punished. Black people were, you know, enslaved, they were prevented from getting educated and, and having all kinds of opportunities. And so then they started, then here's the looping effect. If you don't give people an education, they're not going to be able to read most of them. And then the fact that they can't, can't read makes it seem, well, they shouldn't vote because they're not, they're not able to read, so they shouldn't vote. Mm. Um, we need educated voters. And then if they're not voting, they can't hold public office, you know, they can't do all of this. And so there's a looping effect that keeps a particular group of people poor, uneducated, and not represented. And so it, that's the kind of story that, that social constructionists want to tell about how race emerges in a particular social and economic context. Does that help? Yes. yes. And it, it, we haven't broken free from this, no? It's, no, it's a constant phenomenon. <laughs> yes. No, it's totally. I mean, this is like Michelle Alexander's views, you know, slavery in the U.S. and then Jim Crow, which was a system of, of uh, legal segregation and now mass incarceration. And there is this constant and the pitiful nature of, of American education, right? This is all still happening. And there's this looping effect. Okay, so they're Black, so they're not educable so we're not going to give them an education and then you know there's a there's a whole system there that reinforces the creation of this category um where it's not a natural category it's a socially imposed category okay i, I, I like oh, the, uh, I, okay <laughs> sorry so, i like the what, yeah. <laughs> i like the explanation here so you're dealing with real things emergent things, emergent categories, you're not about, uh, you're not concerned about just concepts, and you're also not concerned about institutional facts per se, but more of how yeah. this kind of power structure, power relations structure brought about and continuously bring about this type of yeah. social structures or social categories. That's right. It's a set of social relations. So social relations are relations like landlord-tenant, mm -hmm. employer-employee, husband and wife, um, you know, parents and children, uh, neighbors. I mean, there's all of these social relations that we stand in. And with those social relations come norms. So you're supposed to treat your neighbor differently than, you know, someone who's from somewhere else. I, you know, you, 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 you know, you well, around here, you shovel, help them shovel their sidewalks <laughs> and you, and you, help them by bringing them food if they're sick and things like this. 
So these are kind of relations that are not, no one came along and said, I hereby designate you a neighbor. You know, there's no <laughs> like surly and assignment of status function. It's <laughs> right, just that right. these are relationships that kind of emerge and then norms are associated with them. And then exchange becomes possible, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a much more organic conception of society. Mm -hmm. And society evolves then, and it evolves given certain pressures, pressures, well, under capitalism, pressures for profit, but also pressures to, you know, care and mm -hmm. to love. I mean, this is something Martha Nussbaum talks about, is that we are caring people. So right now under COVID, you see that there's an incredible outpouring of caring and concern that wouldn't necessarily have been obvious under normal conditions, mm -hmm. but there's these ties and networks of connections and networks of relationships that become more significant and more important when the circumstances change as dramatically as they have. And then, you know, the society starts to change because, you know, the society is made up of these relations. Okay, so your work in the social construction of gender and race does not only aim to provide a theory of these social categories. You also aim to provide a social critique. So how do you understand the idea of a social critique here? Is this a kind of revisionist type or ideological change or political change? So I think of it as um, one form of social critique is ideology critique. And I think that uh, the social constructionist strategy of saying what you think is natural or inevitable or immutable or something is not actually so. Um, and so there's a critique of a certain set of background assumptions and background beliefs. Um, and so that sort of leverages us to see new possibilities for women new possibilities for disabled people, new possibilities for the elderly and things like that. Because, you know, not all elderly people are frail. Not mm -hmm. all elderly people um, are, you know, asexual, things like this. So you begin to allow for the possibility of different, uh, different ways of relating to members of the group because you can see it's not natural or inevitable or whatever that people um, have uh, certain features, that members of the group have those features. Um, uh, but the real issue for social critique is what makes a, a social system, one of these social organizations, unjust. Mm -hmm. Because you can, you know, there are many perspectives from which you can criticize the particular social formations that we live in. And so there is this question, well, when can you say the system is unjust? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So I think that, that, you know, if you're just interested, if you want to say, okay, we know that violence against women is unjust. We know that um, the uh, police brutality against people of color and um, mass incarceration, those are unjust. Sometimes what we do in social critique is that we just say, okay, this is something that we have enough of a consensus about, that the police should not kill black people Mm -hmm. um, for no reason that domestic violence and rape is wrong, then you can say, okay, then what you do is you undertake social critique to figure out why is it that this is accepted or common or how, what are the structures that sustain it? Mm -hmm. Because it's not just an individual, right? It's not just bad actors. The, the police are part of a system that allow and are, they're trained and they're permitted and they're um, in fact even encouraged to take a certain approach toward the constituency that they're supposed to protect. So what you do then when you do a social critique is you say, it's not just bad actors, it's not just an individual, it's part of the system and the norms and the values and the institutions that make up the system that have to be criticized. So this is where the defund the police in the United States is what they're doing is they're saying, look, the police, one of the problems with the police in the US is they're allowed to carry assault weapons. I mean, they, they have tanks, they have these military style equipment 
but this is ridiculous because you don't need this to actually protect the citizens because right. oftentimes what's happening is that they come across someone who's mentally ill or they come across someone who is homeless and you know they, they don't need an assault weapon. So part of what the defund the police does is it says the structure that gives police mm. officers this military equipment is creating circumstances that make them um, uh, scary to people. And so people don't want to cooperate with them. But then they've been taught if someone doesn't cooperate with you, part of the defund the police is, no, you ought to invest in uh, social workers, mental health workers, drug rehab, all of these other things. Take that money that's going into military style weapons and put it into sustaining and protecting an environment, I mean, in a, um, a neighborhood or a community um, so that people can live together in peace and justice. So that is a way of saying, don't just say it's this bad police actor, criticize the system. So that's part of what social critique does. Yes, uh, I, I think this is also very much applicable to the rest of the world because, uh, at least here in the Philippines, that also that's also what happens you now when it comes to um, police abuse and other such uh, actions from authorities, um, so to yes. speak. Yeah. Uh, in uh, I'd like to talk about your uh, recent commentary on Kate Man's um, Down Girl. Yes. Mm -hmm. You argued yes. against um, patriarchy here uh, as the main cause of um, oppression. I think this is also very much related to your discussion on um, police brutality. So um, you identified capitalism as a source as well. Can you talk about this further? Yeah, so, um, so I'm interested, as I mentioned, in thinking about um, society as kind of a system of systems. Um, and the way I think about the systems is that, well, one way to think about systems is that they're organized around the resource that they distribute. So, for example, a healthcare system distributes healthcare, <laughs> health, you know, well being. Um, a transportation system distributes mobility. Um, uh, an economic system distributes wealth. And they don't just distribute it, but they produce it, right? It's producing and, and distributing. Well, it, one question that has been um, part of the feminist debates you know, for 50 years. Is, is patriarchy a system? And if so, what does it distribute? Um, and for a long time, people wanted to say, well, what happens is that there's patriarchy, which manages and controls reproduction and sexuality. And then there's a different system, capitalism, which manages and controls wealth. And then there's racism, that would be a, a, a white supremacy, that manages and controls, well, we're not quite sure, right? What does it manage and control? Well, I guess labor, possibly, uh, status, possibly. But this model doesn't seem to me to work so well um, because I don't really see gender as like transportation, <laughs> that it's a resource that gets, you know, organized and passed around. I mean, sexuality might be, Mm -hmm. But I don't think that the only site for the creation of gender is sexuality or is reproduction and such. And I also think that you can't really think of patriarchy as a single system without understanding that it's also embedded in capitalism and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. So all of these different systems are deeply embedded with each other, these big systems. So what I'd like to think of is there are, we live in this complicated system of systems, healthcare systems, education systems, transportation systems, political systems, economic systems. We live in this, and what happens is that there are dimensions of those systems that privilege men. There are dimensions that privilege cis people. There are dimensions that privilege uh, white people, dimensions that privilege rich people, able-bodied people, et cetera.
but the systems that we're really talking about and that we have to intervene in are these systems like healthcare, policing, uh, uh, politics, economy, and things like that. And so really what we need to do is acknowledge that these are the systems that are distributing the resources. And yes, they privilege some groups of people and, and subordinate other groups of people, but they do it in a way that can't really be separated as patriarchy, white supremacy, capitalism. They're all embedded with one another. So I think that this is in fact what intersectionality teaches us. It teaches us that you can't think about healthcare merely from the point of view of gender or merely from the point of view of race or merely from the point of view of, of wealth. You have to see that all of those things are embedded in any particular practice in healthcare, any particular practice in education is going to be inflected by these different dimensions of, of power and privilege. So what I'm inclined to say is, yes, the system is patriarchal, it's white supremacist, it's capitalist, it's <laughs> ableist, but these aren't separate systems themselves. They are just kind of, uh, forms of injustice that occur in healthcare, in transportation, in education, in the economy, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yes, but correct, uh, uh, in terms of our understanding, correct us if, uh, if we're wrong, because um, are you opposed to the intersectional analysis of oppression or do you actually oh, no. affirm this? I affirm it. So I have to let you know that I have a student who I'm in constant contact. She's a now graduated. She's no longer my student. She's a PhD. She has her own job. But she's giving me grief about this. Like, what is it? What difference does it make if they're the same system or different systems? Why are you worried about this? Is it really that important, et cetera? So I recognize that, that it's not the clearest or the most well-defended thing I've ever said. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that um, intersectionality has to be understood not as white supremacy and patriarchy interacting with each other as two separate systems, yeah. but as the way that um, the systems that organize the resources that we're interested in, like health and food and education and things like this, they, at one and the same time, they privilege along the lines of race and gender and wealth and mm -hmm. ability. But that privileging is built into how this distribution of resources is going. It's not a separate system. Like patriarchy is not a separate system that is working there. It's a way that these systems work, these transportation, these more material systems. Let's put it this way. These are material systems that I'm interested in these material systems are shaped so that certain people end up getting the goods and other people end up being deprived of the goods. And so what I'm interested in is the, is the processes by which all of these systems end up stratifying society. And I don't think it's helpful to think, oh no, well then you just add another system on top of the mm -hmm. transportation system. It's called the gender system or it's called white mm -hmm. supremacy. No, because White supremacy is in every system. It's not just its own system, if, if, that, makes, if that makes sense. Okay, if I just may have a follow-up question. So of you're course. talking about, uh, for example, uh, the white, uh, so we termed it, term it like uh, uh, as such, no? so white capitalist supremacist patriarchy, et cetera, et cetera. Now, yep. if you look at this, uh, these, um, this intersectional systems, no? so you, you uh, What's important here is that we also look at the bigger structures such as health, um, transportation, defense, finance, in order for us to overcome these injustices. Am I correct? Right. So, so that's the right idea. So, so maybe it's useful to think of uh, a material system. And a material system is a system that is directly organizing us to distribute often a material good, right? Material good like health and education and transportation and 
you know, uh, power and the polity and those sorts of things. Citizenship. Okay, so these are the systems that are doing, that are, that are organizing us. Now, once you see, and there are many different ways of organizing us, right? You could do, you could have all these different kinds of education and health and whatever systems like that. In the society, a society picks a particular configuration of these systems in order to make itself work. Some societies organize all that so it creates a racial hierarchy. Some of the societies do that in a way that it creates a class hierarchy, the capitalist ones, and some of them do it in a way that creates a gender hierarchy. And so what we have to do is intervene in the context of healthcare and politics and the economy and all of these things because each of those places where the system is making a distribution, the process by which it makes the distribution is encoding racial privilege and gender privilege and class privilege and ability privilege all at the same time, right? So it's doing that. And so those are the sites of intervention. And so maybe another way to put it is, I don't know how to fight for gender justice in and of itself, in the system of gender. I know how to fight for gender justice in politics, in the economy, in healthcare, in education, and these sorts of things, in sexuality. But these are, are material systems. And what I'm trying to do is locate those moments or those places in those systems where women are, are systematically disadvantaged. And so, yeah, you could say, you know, it's, it's a way of speaking. Okay, the system of patriarchy is the system that unites and organizes how all of these subsystems subordinate women. But the problem is, I don't think it's systematic. I think I think it's kind of a mess, I think. And that's what gives me hope. The fact that it's kind of working this way here, it kind of work in that way there, and, and there's different mechanisms by which it's working. And the fact that it's as fragmented as it is, gives me hope that we can leverage change and, and make progress, because you're gonna start undoing it in all of the different sites where it occurs. I don't know if that makes sense. You're, oh. you're pushing me at the limits of my ability to make sense of my own view. Oh, I'm just curious, uh, how does your view uh, differ from the likes of um, Bell Hooks, for example, or Iris Marianne Young, who talked about uh, these systems of oppression as well? So I don't really think of Hooks or, or Young as really doing a systems approach. Um, I think that, uh, or, I mean, I think that a lot of what Hooks is talk, talks about is um, uh, identities and social norms that are part, certainly a crucial part of the process. But I see her as less materialist than I am in the sense of a kind of Marxian materialist. I see her as a cultural, cultural theorist and a cultural critic and doing really important work and showing us how symbols and norms and, and ideology really plays a crucial role in understanding um, these social categories. And I like to be more grounded in kind of the materiality in a, in a Marxian sense, maybe of how, what are the real resources that are being distributed and, and what criteria of injustice um, should we bring into this to say that this way of distributing the good stuff mm -hmm. is flawed or, or unjust. I don't see myself at odds with hooks, I just see it as a matter of emphasis because, of course, I always also care about ideology and about ideology critique. Jung's work, I'm also very, very sympathetic to. She, I think, is a bit more materialist about this, more like how I am. Um, and 
I think, I can't think of, I mean, I don't really think of myself at odds with Jung. I feel like more I'm tracing out some of the themes in her work um, to develop them and sort of put them in a slightly different framework. Um, but I don't see myself as, as doing something radically different than what she was doing. Okay, so you Does mentioned- that answer your question? Sorry. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so you mentioned about injustices and in our idea that some, some social structures are unjust. So does it mean that this idea of being unjust or being just is outside the system? What I'm, I'm asking is whether, yeah, I'm, what I'm asking here is whether ethics is somewhere out there, not, in, not part and parcel of society itself. Yeah, great question. Um, so I've recently, I have a paper on this. It's called Political Epistemology and Social Critique, and it's on my website, so people can find it if they want. It hasn't yeah. been published yet. Um, but I think that much of ethics and political philosophy um, tries to uh, use our intuitions about what is right and wrong and good and bad to come up with a, an ideal theory of, of how one ought to live and how we ought to organize ourselves and organize our societies in a very abstract way. Um, I think that this process suffers um, pretty seriously from status quo bias. And I think that a lot of our beliefs about the world, uh, the normative beliefs we have are flawed mm. and that they're flawed because we've grown up and been uh, tutored to have a certain ideology about what's good and bad and right and wrong. And then what happens through this process is that we reflect on our considered judgments and then we canonize them and put them in some kind of abstract structure and then evaluate our world in light of that. And I think that's a very flawed way to think about um, critique and think about justice. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we can't, you know, just jump outside of our framework <laughs> um, and say, okay, okay, so all of you people are just doing sort of internal cleaning things up and, um, but neither can we jump completely outside of it because we have to use some tools to think with and we've got the tools we've got. Um, but I, my moral epistemology is really grounded in consciousness raising. So if Kuhn, uh, Thomas Kuhn had a view about scientific progress where there was a, a paradigm that organized us to make sense of a range of phenomena, but the paradigms were always inadequate in some way or other. They always had recalcitrant data or places where they didn't work or the explanations fell apart. And what would happen is that people who were interested in those places where there are things falling apart would propose an alternative paradigm that could do justice to that phenomenon that was inadequately understood from the main paradigm and lots of the other stuff as well. And they could say, oh my gosh, look, this reveals aspects of the world that we hadn't seen before. This reveals um, connections that had been invisible to us. Well, broadly speaking, I think that's what consciousness raising does in the moral domain. What happens is that there are people who are marginalized, who are not captured by the mainstream moral categories, by the mainstream political you know, sense of justice. And they, you come together and there's a process by which it's not just you as an individual, but you together with a group of people who are similarly situated, try to come up with a better interpretation of what's going wrong, a better interpretation where I really want to hold it to epistemic standards of betterness. Mm -hmm. It does better justice to the phenomenon. It's coherent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can aim for some kind of situated objectivity. And then you said, look, this is a different paradigm that shows if we think about things this way, we gain moral knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I think, for example, domestic violence, right? Back in the day, you know, domestic violence, that was just a private matter between in the private sphere of a, a man and his wife and children or something. And so the police couldn't intervene. 
there was going to be, um, it's probably what she deserved, a set of assumptions around <laughs> domestic violence, right? Yeah, and yeah. then what the consciousness raising did is say, no, this is domestic violence and public violence are both assaults on individuals who are entitled to their rights. Mm -hmm. And you can't say just because my husband did it to me, it's not an assault. It is still an assault. And so there's a kind of paradigm shift for, under, for breaking down the public-private distinction. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of move that came out of consciousness raising about from people who were suffering from domestic violence and the women um, and, and some men who had, and some children who had experienced this. So there I think that what you gain is moral knowledge. You gain moral knowledge that the fact that it's done behind closed doors in someone's house doesn't make it permissible, right? It's impermissible there just as it's impermissible by a stranger on the street. And that kind of moral knowledge is achieved. So, so what I'm suggesting is that, that instead of having uh, a sort of abstract moral philosophy that's done in a seminar room, what you do is you reach people who are marginalized, whose experience of the moral, you know, of, of injustice is, is hurting, um, and you bring them together uh, or bring us together because it's not like the, the, there's, the authorities are going to bring them together and say, you guys figure it out. It's, you know, we, <laughs> we create a movement mm -hmm. and we work together to try and come up with a new paradigm to understand what is unjust here? Why is this unjust? How is it affecting us? And one of the advantages of that view is that it's more able to deal with the historical and cultural specificity of wrong and how you are going to overcome that historical and cultural specificity. So the legacy of slavery in the United States, the legacy of the Holocaust in, in Germany and Europe, these are historical legacies that, that create you know, frames of meaning and understanding. And to come in and you say, okay, we're just gonna give an abstract story of how <laughs> reparations is gonna work. No, you can't do that, yeah. right? Because reparations are a response to a historical wrong. And so by using consciousness raising of the people who are directly affected, you can then begin to think about how to reshape the society, how to reshape the norms, how to reshape the social relations in a way that's going to be more just. Okay, how so do these social critiques uh, apply to the current global situation, in particular, the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a bit easier to think about how it works for Black Lives Matter because that has a longer history in the civil rights movement and the, and the, the um, resistance that has gone on for a very long time in the context of, of the United States. Um, and so understanding that history, the history of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and the history of desegregation and the history of the great migration, this is important for understanding how reparations might or might not work. Um, and COVID, I think it interacts with a lot of different issues and it's fairly new. So my analysis of it is, is much less developed, but clearly it interacts with issues of of race and racism and class and who counts as essential workers and such like that um, and healthcare and the difficulty yeah. uh, in the United States because we don't have we don't have decent healthcare. But one place where I think it's quite interesting is consciousness raising about what counts as an essential worker. Now, mm -hmm. in the U.S., um, the the restrictions on mobility and work and all of that. Um, divided essential workers from inessential workers. Essential workers were people who, you know, drove the buses, worked in um, worked in uh, pharmacies, um, mm. or otherwise worked in medical care. Um, but it's not just that. There were other people, like hardware stores, were open. Various things were open, um, and and essential workers were the people. I mean, grocery store workers, people who unpack, you know. Uh, 
groceries or, or the truckers who mm. bring the groceries. These are all essential workers. Well, many of these people are people who are ordinarily invisible, right? They're, they're invisible. They're incredibly exploited. They don't get any recognition. And so in the context of COVID, there's a possibility of a kind of consciousness raising about who is an essential worker. It's mm. not the bankers. It's not the real estate brokers. It's not the, the you know, people who are making mega bucks. The people who are essential to maintain life in our society are the people who are the least well-respected, the least recognized, the least well-paid. And so this gives a moment for sort of doing consciousness raising and, and building a movement that could potentially get, gain more recognition and more pay, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see it happening right at the moment. I mean, I see the appreciation of essential workers, whether it's gonna change the economy. But you know, they did, they were getting much more unemployment, the people who had, uh, and people who, um, more recognition that the, the medical workers need insurance. Mm -hmm. These are things that, that are, have greater recognition, but it hasn't yet flipped into a full-blown movement. Okay, so you're not only a professor of philosophy, you're also a social advocate, as we can see. So what is, is it like to work with other radical thinkers? Or would you consider yourself as a radical thinker in the first place? I hope I'm a radical thinker. <laughs> so I think that that's a, that's a, a term of honor. And I don't think it's, it's something that I could really attribute to myself because it would be claiming a kind it would be a kind of hubris and arrogance to say mm -hmm. but I, I aspire to be a radical thinker um, I think uh, it's a it's a it's it's a wonderful thing to have a community of people to think through these things with and I do have a very strong feminist philosophy community I have a, a group of uh, critical race theorists and critical race philosophers I, I work with um, I have another group of people who are just a bunch of old 60s, 70s radicals <laughs> who are, uh, do our philosophers. Right. And we just, we, we read articles in certain journals and go, oh my God, I can't stand this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like this. Um, and then uh, try to find other things that, are, uh, that are, are more supportive of our points of view. Um, but I also feel as though I have a lot of other people in the academy um, at MIT and other places across um, the United States and elsewhere in Europe um, who care about these issues and we try to leverage our power as academics to make a difference, um, make a difference to help other people in the academy, but also raise questions about how our society is structured. Um, and that's a really, that, that keeps me going, that keeps me Keeps, keeps me getting up every day and working my butt off every day um, because that's what really matters to me. And I do love writing and I love doing philosophy and I love teaching. Um, I'm teaching this term a, a course on gender and development with another radical um, about how to, how to make a difference um, in development without having it be a kind of colonial effort or a an effort of, of privilege and power, um, but how to empower groups of people, um, waste pickers, how to empower waste pickers, how to empower um, sex workers, how to empower um, people who are um, AIDS orphans. Um, how do you do that in a way that is politically appropriate, um, and especially in this class where gender is, a, is an important issue? Um, so those are things that I, I, I really love. So I try as much as possible to integrate my activism in my research and in my teaching. And, uh, but I also just have to, I have a backpack. It's a, it's a clear backpack. It has a bottle of water and, a, and a, some goggles for tear gas. It has you know, <laughs> my card as an ID. I don't include my driver's license. My card is an ID. It includes a tambourine so that I can make sound. I need a tambourine because I'm often holding a sign. And so you can't clap, so you need a tambourine. You know, anyway, so I have it ready to go. I have, I have probably 10 different foam core boards with different things written on them, ready to go at the drop of a hat. 
Um, yeah, so <laughs> that work matters to me too. What's your advice to people who are currently struggling in their careers in academic philosophy while trying to balance their social and radical advocacies like you? Yeah. Well, I'm really lucky at this point in my career because I'm very secure uh, in, my, in my academic life. Um, I sometimes can't believe that other people refuse to sign certain petitions or something because of their career. I'm going, oh my God, you're a tenured professor at MIT. What is going to happen to you, right? Um, you know, it just makes me feel crazy. It's like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm out there, right? What are they going to do to me? They can't do anything to me. Um, uh, in this particular socio-historical moment at MIT, they're not going to do anything to me. Um, but uh, I think that there are other people who are much more precarious and much more vulnerable. And, um, and I think that they do need to make um, strategic decisions about um, protecting themselves and their careers and their livelihoods um, and in ways that I don't. And those strategic decisions, it's very difficult to make general recommendations about them because people are so very differently situated. Um, a question that does come up is whether it's, whether, I mean, this came up throughout my whole career, is it, should I stay in philosophy? Should I continue to be an academic? Or should I just become a full-time activist, a, a, a community organizer, a, a, a law professor, not even a professor, a lawyer um, who is more on the front lines? And I'm not convinced that um, that being a philosophy professor is the best way to promote social justice. But I did have a conversation with someone many, many years ago. Her name is Mitsu Yamada. Mm. She's a Japanese American a poet and essayist. And I knew her because I was doing activist work. Uh, since she was also doing activist work. And I said, Mitsu, I don't, I just can't, believe I'm going to spend my life, you know, doing philosophy in a university when there's so much injustice in the world and why, why am I doing this? And she said, well, um, she had been interned in a Japanese concentration camp in the United States when, when she was young. Mm -hmm. And she's written her poetry and some of her essays are about that. And, and she said, well, you know, I've done a lot of activism in my life. I've walked in a lot of marches and I've organized groups of people and I've done this and I've done that. But the thing that has had the most impact, I believe, is my writing. Because once you write something and you publish it, it goes out into the world and it can spread and you don't have to do anything. It just does it. And you don't know where it goes. And then someone you walk up to, you know, 20 years later said they read a poem of yours or an essay of yours or this or that and it changed their life. And you say you cannot underestimate the the power of of writing, the power of the word. And if you can find ways to write, and even if your work isn't the word that spreads, but it affects people who write things that spread, that this is a way to have an impact. And you cannot underestimate the value of that. So that meant a lot to me. It meant. I mean, very much, very much to me. And um, I think I've, I've felt that the combination of, of being a, a writer and having some authority by virtue of my academic position, mm -hmm. where I have voice, I have more voice than some others do, that I could use that power and that capability to try and, and make important change. Now, or, or passing a law that, you know, the Violence Against Women Act or something like that. But I think we all have to do what is meaningful to us and was, was within our realm of capabilities. I also learned as an activist, I'm not that good as an activist. I'm good at showing up <laughs> and being there and caring, but I, I do have this problem where, in an activist group when where people are saying, we have to do this next, and we have to do this <laughs> next, I have a tendency to say, 
oh, I think I need to read a little bit more about that, or we need to think about that a little bit more, or whatever. I'm a little, I'm a little bit in my head, <laughs> and I have skills, but I'm not the best leader, activist, organizer in the world. So the, what I decided for me, and each person has to decide for themselves, that the combination of skills that I have and what I can offer and the, and the opportunities that were available to me, that this was, was a way to go. But I don't think it's the obvious way to go. I think that it's a very difficult set of choices. Okay, so finally, as a philosopher, you have devoted most of your life thinking about things that matter in our social lives. Would you say that this career is worth it? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. It's hard to know. Um, there's a, 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 I mean, I, it's been meaningful to me. So if you say, is it worth it to me? Oh my God, yes. I mean, it's, it's all consuming. It it's, gives me great joy. It gives me great despair. You know, it's everything. And, and so it's worth it to me, but is it worth it in the sense that, that all this effort, has it really made any difference at all? Um, I think those are the sorts of things that one can't, can't, necess you know, can't necessarily know that right now in the middle of it. Um, there's a wonderful quote by, oh, I'm not gonna be able to get it because I'm in full screen. If you go on my website, um, sallyhasslinger.weebly.com and you go there in the far right that says favorite quotes. There's a, a passage by Rebecca Solnit from her book, um, Hope in the Dark. And in it, she says, sometimes, I'm gonna paraphrase, and she says it beautifully, of course, sometimes a person's words, you know, inspire movement and sometimes um, her words affect people who affect people who affect people and the movement comes across comes upon us like a change in the weather mm -hmm. um and it and it just feels to me as though you know impact i don't know and mm -hmm. if i had done something else maybe i would have you know gotten too depressed to do anything or maybe i would have just been really bad at it <laughs> counterfactuals are really hard for me to evaluate but is this a meaningful life for me yes yes Okay. And I have to say, I want to also include my family. Mm -hmm. So my family is, is a really important part of my life and not just as, you know, uh, a, a group of people I love, but I, I believe that I, I live in a non-traditional family. And I believe that it, that it has had it made a difference. I, I believe that I, I'm exemplifying my values in my family and my children are carrying these values forward. And that means a lot to me. Okay. So thanks, Sally, for sharing your time with us. And I hope you guys learned a lot from this interview. Join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we talk about things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers.